Okay, good evening, colleagues. Uh, it's really late, but welcome to the number 26 Tourism Online Forum series in October 2023. This series is hosted by the Center for Advanced Tourism Research, CATS, at Hokkaido University. This is your host, Mo. Today, we are very honored to have Dr. Mike Dugan to share his recent research utilizing major events as a platform and driver for social change. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to talk about the Olympic today, but uh, Professor Mike is uh, is a researcher, research Tokyo Olympic. Okay, so uh, my Professor Mike, uh, uh, let me introduce him. He's a tenured associate professor at the Rosen College of Hospitality Management, University of Central Florida. And he is also the editor in chief of the leading journal of the study and analysis of event and festivals called Event Management. And formerly, Mike was a, a associate professor and department chair at the Department for Events in the School of Hospitality and Tour Tourism Management, University of Surrey in the UK, where he was also the director of the Observatory of Human Rights and Major Events, the UK's official Olympic Studies Center, supported by the International Olympic Committee and Team GB. Over the past decades, Mike has uh, traveled the world, examining the economics and social impact of hosting major events, including the London 2012, Rio 2016, Tokyo 2020, and now the Paris 2024 and LA 2028 20, Games, alongside various of the events like uh, Commonwealth Games and regional sports and cultural events. This work has been, uh, his work has been published in leading journals and funded a lot of small scale grants from the International Olympic Committee to the European Union. Mike is uh, committed to real world impact has significant experience consulting and ad, uh, advising a range of event-related actions, including event owners, organizers, through to the tourist uh, boards, with the aim of working with the stakeholders to optimize the power and potential events for social and economic goods. Mike's work has been uh, feathered in international media, uh, less equals to uh, the guardians, and uh, has given interviews debated live on radio and TV uh, from the BBC to one hour debate with the Sky News. Wow, sounds fantastic. On the global events uh, response to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. If you want more information, I will share his uh, website uh, in the chat. Uh, but I would say, Mike, we are so happy to have you here. So if you don't mind, uh, I will talk to the audience, please note that this lecture is already recorded and will be uploaded to the first coming uh, to our YouTube channel. So let's invite Mike uh, Sensei to share his research. And Thanks. please leave your Q&A in the, in the Q&A box anytime. Thank you. The floor Thanks, is yours. Man. Yeah, thank you. I'm so sorry for giving you such a such a long introduction for a bio <laughs> for me. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Mike uh, Dignan. I'm from the University of Central Florida, like Meng said. Um, I've spent the last 10 years, um, 10, 15 years researching the Olympics, um, trying to really understand whether they're good for us, uh, whether they're good for the citizens and the people that, that host them, whether they're good for the governments, whether they leave a net positive value um, for for people and places. Uh, the jury's still out in lots of different ways, and I think it depends on one's perspective as to what you think about that. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about that research. This talk really brings together some of these key ideas as to um, uh, why I think that this is really important, um, kind of that I've had over the last um, probably about a decade, um, and I've amalgamated these points into this presentation um, here for you to all to consider for your own research. So huge honor to be here. Thank you so much, Meng, for, for inviting me. Um, and thank you for staying up so late um, as well. I know that it's a challenge. Uh, I don't know whether I would, uh, and hopefully it's worth it. Um, so I'll crack on really with my, my presentation. So I'll quickly share my 
at screen. Um, let me okay, let me know if you can share your screen. Super. Can you see the whole screen? Is that yes, is that okay? Wonderful. No problem. Fab. Okay, so my talk is um, entitled Major Events as a Driver for Social Change. Um, it's quite a broad title, um, and that's why I wanted to add in some of the, the key, key areas that I think that we play as academics, um, how we can work better with, with policy and industry, how we can um, include these conversations in our research to make our research as strong as possible so we can um, not only influence on the ground, um, real life ideas, but also bring that into our research to write really great publications um, that not only advance the field uh, in a positive way, um, but also are really um, easy to read and accessible to our students, um, of whom will be the next generation of uh, leaders. So again, thank you so much for, for inviting me to kind of come and talk about these things. So um, my forward button is not working. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> it's, not going, it's not going forward <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll do it manually okay uh, there we go that's because i'm at the back all right all right Sorry. Yeah, there we go wonderful for some reason it did that cool so I, i'm gonna talk through 10 um important themes um these are why I believe, and, and hopefully everyone in the room believes that uh, why events are really important and interesting and why they transform um, places, people, individual lives. Um, the role that we have, like I mentioned, uh, together, um, taking an interdisciplinary perspective, working with people on the ground in order to uh, make a change. And I think that personally, all of us in the room and people that are in leisure related fields um, outside of a specific discipline, um, have a real power to make a change. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, some of the challenges that we face trying to kind of make a change and what we need to think about going forward in terms of understanding the role of major events for social change. Why we should care about it all. Um, number five, why it's important to not only think about what these events do for economies and places, but also for the individuals who take part in them. Um, I think quite often we forget um, that this is a very individual experience that everyone has in terms of how they're impacted. And that's really, really important. Then we have the pregacies and the legacies that are left over. This is very interesting for Tokyo 2020, obviously disrupted by COVID that posed huge challenges. But one of my arguments was that Tokyo and Japan had already accrued a huge amount of value leading up to the event. Um, and although it was disruptive and, and, and there was a financial cost, um, the country had achieved a huge amount of benefit uh, from the event before the event even occurred and hopefully long afterwards um, as well. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Seven, uh, my view, and I think the view of a lot of management scholars um, and people that are writing in this field is that events serve as important bat signals when change is needed in a country. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that. And that segues into what I refer to as a field configuring events perspective. This is a new theoretical lens um, that increasingly scholars are using um, to um, examine the power and potential of events. We just wrote the first paper in tourism management um, looking, using, looking at events using this perspective, and we're trying to popularize it um, a lot. Um, then number nine is, is, is a really kind of deep critique into why these events are also really bad for us and how we need to make them uh, change in lots of different ways. And then finishing off with some key takeaways. So in some sense, why are events really, really important? They have always been really important um, uh, policymaking tools and major sports events have always been a northern star for people in global policymaking, in country policymaking, for governments to think, what should we do next? And use the event as a way to transform national policymaking in lots of different ways. One of the examples is that major sports events back in the 50s, um, just before uh, you hosted the first 
um, uh, uh, Olympics, um, you uh, utilized the event in a way to completely transform after the war um, people's perceptions and urban development plans and urban regeneration um, after um, hosting uh, the events. And, and that's really, really powerful. Japan's image completely transformed and it completely continues to transform as a result of hosting all of these large scale events in some way. And that's really, really fascinating because without the event, you would often not see these kinds of benefits accrued. So the event serves as an ecosystem, a way to project forward. This is who we want to be. And that's really, really fascinating. And there's not that many things in this world that can do that as well as a major event. The second is that leisure and events by de facto is a, deemed as a third space. Um, you've got home, you've got work, and then you've got leisure. Um, and in third space, um, the everyday processes of society are brought together with something very, very novel, very, very new. And it's in this novelty side, in this flipping of society in lots of different ways that we see new opportunities occur. And that's the reason why they are quite powerful. So conceptually, being a third space gives them an enormous amount of power for making change happen, as we do see in these uh, industries of hospitality, tourism, leisure, and major events, for example. We have our own journals. We have a huge amount of journals uh, that are focusing on events. But all the journals, whether again, you're in sports, hospitality, tourism, leisure, events, we all have this one objective. How can we make events better? And it's coming together of everyone toward this common goal, which is exceptionally powerful. If, for example, you were just simply a historian or a sociologist or an anthropologist working in a very specific discipline, you would not have your eyes so much on the challenges, the real world challenges that you need to face as a researcher to try and make change happen. We don't come from particularly a disciplinary or single disciplinary perspective. We are often focused on challenges. So, for example, Meng's work, for example, talks about social revitalization in rural communities. That's not a discipline. That's a real life problem that we have to overcome now. And a lot of us come from uh, that perspective. And I personally think that that's very, very powerful. We can make change happen by drawing on ideas from lots of different disciplines. But the problem is, is that in a lot of these pure disciplines, including sociology, geography, um, economics, they still, in some sense, disrespect um, the idea of studying tourism, events, hospitality, sports, these very, very applied fields. Because I always think it's a little bit like Harry Potter. Um, you have the purists in Harry Potter that think that we should only be one way and we should only think in disciplinary terms and bringing some of these purer ideas together. But for us, we are happy to mix ideas up to solve contemporary challenges. And that's a debate that's gonna go on for many, many decades, but it's a debate that's happening anyway. But I personally think that a lot of academics all over the world in disciplines are looking to what we're doing and thinking, maybe we need to be a bit more practical. Maybe we have to have some more impact on the communities that we're trying to serve. And I think that that's really important. And because of that issue, what you find is that a lot of the core ideas in disciplines, and I personally come from management studies, some of these core ideas have never been developed out of events and festivals, for example, as a context. So a lot of the core theoretical principles and ideas that are in the literature haven't really been designed or understood through the empirical context of events. Why is that important? Well, again, I personally think, and from my research, that events have done something ex and are exceptionally interesting case studies to build theory and build our understanding of society more generally. Um, and I think that that's a really, really interesting space for a lot of us that are working in this field. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, 
events cause change to happen in lots of different ways. We manage and influence national and international agendas, as we've seen, for example, in Japan in the lead up to Tokyo 2020, but also with the Osaka Expo and all the other international sporting events that you have in your country that you're using to try and shift the dial and try and make some sort of positive change in Japan. But we see this all over the world. So that's why I think that events are interesting. But of course, that's not just it. Uh, they're interested in so many ways. And I'm sure we'll all have our different perspective on that, whether we're an academic or whether we've actually been to an event ourselves. So my second point is that because of all of that, all of us in the room who are studying leisure context, but in this case, major events, have this superpower. And this superpower is called convergence. So at the very, very top, you see that we have the interdisciplinary perspectives on the right hand side at the top. This is a very typical perspective that we've had historically, whereby we've thought that a group of ideas, theories, concepts, explanations of the world are the ways in which we should um, examine contemporary problems. And that was pretty common for hundreds, uh, if not a century of ideas. And we've obviously moved towards this idea of multidisciplinarity whereby we're using multiple disciplines to solve multiple issues and contemporary problems. And that's been a really, really positive step forward over the last 50 years, for example. Then we have the concept of interdisciplinarity. It's very, very interesting. We're still working out how to properly do it, but it's how do we bring together very disparate ideas across very disparate disciplines in order to come together to create a a creative solution to a contemporary issue. And the contemporary issue here is represented by the white dot in that picture. And then we have the idea of convergence. This is very interesting. This is the idea of interdisciplinarity, but also uh, mixing in conventional knowledge, not just academic knowledge in the red, but conventional knowledge in the yellow. And it's this bringing together of stakeholders um, that we're seeing, which is really, really useful when you're an applied field um, like we are, that wanna to mix together ideas, not only in academia, but also in industry. And it's through all that, that we're able to have this contemporary debate to tackle real life issues. For me, this is where what we're doing is quite special in our fields, bringing together disciplines to solve contemporary issues. So I would argue that this is special because we don't have to defend our disciplines. We're not trying to defend ideas. We're trying to defend people. We're trying to defend problems. We're trying to solve problems. And it's that collaboration that is very, 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 very interesting. And as an editor of our main journal and events and festivals, this is where I want to see the research go. I want to see research that is contemporary, that's interesting, that's relevant. And, and that's the way that we're going to get it through that idea of convergence. So my view is that the people that are doing this really have their eyes on the prize. And if you feel that maybe you're not there in terms of going out there and trying to work with stakeholders, international stakeholders, regional stakeholders, communities, have a little think about how that works and maybe talk to um, some of the colleagues in your area who might be doing that um, in, a, in, a, in a strong way. But we do have some huge challenges when understanding um, the power and potential of events for social change. First of all, we have the challenge that we often look at events in a very immediate way, in a very short term way. And communities will say, is Tokyo 2020 worth it for us? Um, is this event doing and giving us a return on investment right now? And that's a really, really important question. And that's a question that still needs to be answered. But my view is in the literature, a lot of this work, the longitudinal stuff is missing completely. Understanding how, for example, um, Tokyo 2020 um, and all the other major sports events are shifting the dial on loads of other social and economic priorities in the long term. That might be three years, it might be five years, it might be 10 years, it might be 20 years. And I think the best example of this, as I mentioned before, is just the fact that a lot of 
um, Japanese citizens really do know the rep, the role that um, the Olymp the first time you hosted the Olympics in Tokyo, the role that had in transforming the urban environment, transforming international perceptions about Japan. Everyone knows it. I read it in my all my research. People who were giving me primary data, people that were writing in uh, the, the Japan Times and various other media outlets, it always came up that people know the power of the previous Olympics. And we just hope that they understand that that long term effect will also occur in Tokyo 2020. And we might not know that now. We might not understand it now. But that doesn't mean that it's not happening. And it's really important that we continue to try and understand and articulate that. And that brings us to the concept of um, event portfolios. In a destination, we have a whole range of different events going on um, all, over the, uh, all over the world, but inside a destination. And you have a whole range of events. Tokyo 2020 is just one of these events that occur across many of the events. But we need to be so much better as a government, as a group of scholars, as people on the ground to understand what each event is doing for us. We need to think about them as a portfolio with Tokyo 20 just being one of them. And that's because, and this was a conversation that I had with Holger Proust, um, who is currently the head of the Paris 2024 Evaluation Committee. And we were talking, and he's also a very strong professor in um, the economics of events, but also understanding legacy of events, the long-term benefits of events. And we were talking about the idea that all events don't have to do everything. We have to understand what every event is doing in turn um, and how that comes together towards tackling big issues um, in the country, in the destination, for local people. And it's until we get to that point that uh, we won't really understand the power and potential of events together. And I would say this is really important because we're currently in an existential turn in major events. There are many, many people, and we saw this during the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, but also seen this all around the world, that people were questioning the value of hosting these events. Is this event good enough for me? Is it good enough for my community? Is it worth the money? And we've recently seen the Commonwealth Games in Victoria 2026 um, cancelled, completely cancelled um, in three years time because they couldn't explain the value really for the event for local people and it was costing too much money. So we're in this turn and it's a very interesting turn whereby people are losing faith in major events as a powerful driver for social good. But I worry about that because my view, and maybe the view of, of academics in the room, is that this is a data problem. This is a problem that we just don't really understand how to showcase the benefits, tell people the story of the benefits. It's not a case of the fact that the benefits aren't existing. You know, I'm of the mind that they do exist, but they exist in very different ways and very difficult ways to manage. That's the problem. You also have the issue that these events need to be just fundamentally managed better. And, and the concept of paradox, particularly the concept of organizational paradox is a really, really important one. Um, it's a really difficult one to explain in a talk like this, but we've written with Milena Parent um, and David McGilvery in Event Management Journal, the idea of paradox in event planning. Um, the idea that managers often choose, often see paradoxes as contradictions that need to be um, resolved. You either choose to bring in global sponsors, for example, and ignore the local people and the local sponsors. But that's a co they see it as a contradiction that needs to be resolved. But actually, a lot of Eastern thinking, a lot of thinking in Japan, which I was very much confronted with, with was the idea that you can honor paradox. You can honor contradictions. You can allow them to exist at the same time. You can al allow global sponsors to benefit at the same time as local people to benefit. You can bring in McDonald's and Budweiser 
as corporate sponsors to feed and and and, and drink uh, the crowds. But you can also bring in local Japanese cuisine in the supply chains. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. But the problem with a lot of the Western thinking in events is the fact that we try to resolve paradox, but we should honor it instead. And this is fundamentally important. And we do write a little bit about that, how we can do that. Because unless we start honoring paradox, only the corporate and commercial sponsors will primarily win out of these things. And we won't find space for local people. So we really do need to think about how we balance interests and, uh, and, and honor these contradictions in events. This is a key theme that keeps on coming up in my research, but also everyone else's. Why should we care about all of this? Events only exist um, to generate some sort of social value for people. They don't exist because they exist. They exist because they help people. They help communities. They help citizens in lots of different ways. And that's really important because stakeholders particularly the event owners, like the International Olympic Committee, like FIFA, um, like major sport event organizers at the local level in local government, are increasingly saying, we are only going to fund you and give you these events if you show us that it provides a return on investment. Um, if you show us that they don't leave people worse off. Um, this is important because Events really do require a huge amount of public money, but they also disrupt and displace existing socioeconomic activity that is going on anyway. So you know, not only have to justify why you're spending so much money on them, but you also have to illustrate that all the disruption is worth it. And at the moment, we don't do that enough at all. Governments don't do that at all. And this is the reason why a lot of governments are requesting academics, but also consultants all the all around the world to develop new impact evaluation modeling. And we're seeing the uh, contracts for these uh, occur all the time. Um, that's because governments don't exactly know what they're doing all the time. They really don't. Um, and, and they need help. Um, and we they can't do it on their own. And we need to help them do that as academics. And we need to feel empowered by doing that. And of course, that will differ based on where you are in the world. Some governments are more likely to listen to you than others. Um, but it's really important that we try. We should also care because events have really moved out of um, uh, private venues in terms of stadiums um, and, 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 and fixed locations. And they're now increasingly delivered within new open and public spaces. Why does that matter? This is really interesting for tourism scholars. This is really interesting for hospitality and sports scholars, urban designers, urban planners, because events have moved from being isolated inside venues to being delivered as part of our everyday life. This means that they're impacting on our lives and livelihoods so much, but we don't really understand how to maximize that opportunity. We don't know how to bring people together um, in a way that brings them together with the event to try and make everything better in whatever way. And, and so that's a really unique opportunity in my view, um, but also a challenge. They're really impacting people in ways that we don't really understand. You know, we're putting big music festivals inside um, public parks round uh, residential areas, but residential areas are becoming very tired with all the noise and disruption. And we need to think about better ways to bring and harmonize the communication between them. This is important because we need to think about how all the communities, when an event comes to town, um, can, um, uh, can benefit from hosting these things. And we've written uh, lots of things that essentially conceptualize the idea that events act as in cities within cities. They don't really engage fully with the local communities at all in lots of different ways. They, they need to do that better, particularly the big ones. And so they tend to be poorly embedded or not very inclusionary um, to local interests. They often erect walls or barriers and require tickets to enter. And, and that's, a, that's a real challenge in, in lots of different ways. But we have an opportunity. We have a real opportunity to understand 
the relations between the events and the people and the places that 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 host these things. The problem is, is that we don't really have any agreed way of analyzing and evaluating events. So in, for us, it's a thinking about how as academics, we can help provide some thought leadership in order how we actually do that. And this is important because events and festivals all over the world are contributing to national and international global GDP. Um, and they're being delivered in lots of different ways. And we really, it's incumbent upon us to think about how we um, have one objective. And that objective is to try and understand how we legitimize, sustain the existence, continuation, growth, and success of events as productive, sustainable, and inclusive modes of social and economic development. So we have some way to go, but things are improving absolutely all the time. So my next point is that we need to be a lot more aware of what these events are doing for the individuals at the center of it. We often talk in broader um, economic terms, but the individuals at the center of these things um, also transform. And if you look at the individual level and understand and collect data about how individuals transform as a result of coming to these events, whether that's it might be um, athletes and people with disabilities, for example, that might be local community groups that might be socioeconomically deprived by understanding all the people or it might be attendees at the event, uh, understanding the stories and the journeys that everyone goes on individually um, and collecting data uh, through that. Uh, can give you a, if you bring all that together, it can give you a really in-depth understanding of how events serve as rite of passages um, for everyone that's part of it. And that's because we have this kind of model in front of us whereby people move from their ordinary life, they see an event on the horizon, they anticipate it, they then go to the event, and then they're free of all the everyday challenges and struggles because events and festivals are these spaces whereby people can be free and, and do something different that they might not normally do in society. And in the event itself, you have this animation phase, which is at the very beginning um, and the very middle, sorry. Um, and there it brings together communities spontaneously to talk about different areas of life but also ideologically, how they see um, the world, how they think of the world and, and, and want to think about it in a better place. You have all of these conversations that are going on inside events um, that you wouldn't normally have um, outside of the event because people are getting on with their daily work, their daily chores, the things that they're, they're doing as part of their jobs and careers. And Events are special for allowing people to reflect in that sense. Um, then the idea is that people are, if they go to the event in lots of different ways, um, better off as a result of going to these events. They're enhanced in some sense and they take that enhancing effect and they reconcile their identity in lots of different ways. And as a result of that, they become maybe more productive citizens and, um, and they become um, better workers, uh, they become more socially consciously minded people maybe, um, and then that normalizes back into their ordinary life. And the idea is that that's a really kind of theoretical and complicated model in lots of different ways, but this is the truth. This is the truth. This, people go on a rite of passage. They go to these events, not because they want to just go to an event, but they go to them because they wanna feel like they're gonna transform and be better people as a result of these things. So therefore, how do we capture that as event organizers, as scholars, as government? And how do we bring that together in order to understand that? And this is really interesting because there's emerging research that suggests that people's emotional and positive emotional responses to events are higher at the anticipation phase and the um, the after phase when they're looking back nostalgic on the event um, then actually being at the event you have a more positive emotion because you do as Plato's theory of the forms talks about 2000 odd years ago that people always smooth out their experiences 
before you go on holiday with your family, uh, you think it's going to be much more smoother and much more enjoyable. But actually on the holiday, you have to wait in line at Disney. You have to wait in the queues. You have to wait for your luggage. The plane can be let, delayed. And all of these challenges make, make the experience a little bit more bumpier. And so the idea is that we do smooth out our experiences before and after. And, 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 it's, uh, and we refer to this as remembered happiness. Um, we remember the happiness different than the actual happiness because we remember the highs um, of the experience and, of course, the lows as well. Um, but that's the idea. And it's really it's a really interesting space. And a lot of people that are working in experience research would also argue that this is the case um, too, really. And a basic point here that that really, uh, you know, all my research leading up to Tokyo 2020 was trying to really extrapolate the value that that the country and, and the organizers and the event had uh, for the event. It was really fascinating to see um, how uh, you uh, as a country repositioned yourself um, in the eyes of the international tourist community, um, how that led to increased um, foot flows, international tourists, people talking about uh, Japan, Tokyo, various other places, how you got social media influences to create documentaries and social media campaigns and various other things around. Um, and you, ha you had this hype and you continue to benefit from this hype um, in lots of different ways, in ways that we don't know, that we, we can't research deeply enough because it's, it's, it's too innovative, it's too big. Um, but there are these things. And of course, uh, bad things as well. You know, there's, there's social challenges that in Japan uh, that need to be challenged as a result of uh, hosting these things. No country is perfect. And we see this in London. We see this in Rio. We see this in Qatar. We see this in Paris. We see this in Brisbane. Every country has its challenges. And, and events are a way to shed light on these challenges to try and be better. But it's also a way to honor the local culture, heritage, what you all have to offer. Um, and that's really fascinating. And without the event, that just wouldn't necessarily happen in the intensity that we see. So understanding what we refer to here as pregacy, these pre-legacies is really important. And we don't really research these things. Um, rarely do I ever see a research paper that talks about the pregacy of, of, of these large scale events. So for me, this is a huge gap in the literature that you might wish to consider. And if you wanna have a chat about that, please do feel free to contact me afterwards. Um, and 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 these pregnancies occur in in different levels. Obviously, you know, I talk there about the international um, uh, changing of of Japan's brand. But then, for example, at the regional level, the way in which Japan explicated the the cultural nuances about um, what each region stands for, why people are proud about culture in particular regions, and how they can bring together the people as part of the tourist offer, it's fascinating. And there's so much research that can be done in this sense. And, and this model here gives you an a sense of like maybe how you could approach it. And this is from a colleague um, called Genevieve, um, who runs an organization called Meet for Impact. You create this framework in front of you, which is that a lot of us probably, hopefully in the room, we have maybe three core ambitions. We want to create events that are or, 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 you know, whatever interventions to create thriving economies so it improves the livelihoods and lives of people inside the country. We also want to um, protect the environment to create healthy ecosystems that they have limited impact. That's an interesting one when it comes to Japan and Tokyo 2020, the over tourism challenges that you guys had, um, the disruption and displacement and the challenges at the local level. Uh, with with so many tourists coming in to the country is something that we felt that we needed to talk about. And we wrote a paper in the Annals of Tourism Research um, on um, how communities were resisting uh, some of the over-tourism challenges that, 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 that Japan was facing. Um, but we also want to do that with thinking about social equity and, and making sure that whenever we host an event or whenever we uh, want to achieve a certain outcome, we think about it with social equity in mind, that we distribute the benefits um, equally, or at least um, justly, 
uh, to improve well-being across uh, different communities in the country. And we have all of these capitals in front of us, this natural built financial, political, human, social, intellectual, cultural. We have all of these different types of capital that are accrued and developed and influenced by hosting events that occur across all of those different areas of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and, and the triple bottom line that we see here, the environmental, the economic and the social dimensions. So there's a huge amount of different areas that if you're not necessarily an, an, an event scholar or a tourism scholar, but you're an economist, then for me, events and festivals in this sense are a really interesting area that you could look into. Um, and this is particularly really, really important because events only exist. And this is my um, I think it's my fifth point, but I'll, I'll I'll be a bit quicker on my next points just to finish maybe in 15 minutes. And then we can have some uh, Q&A and maybe people can go to bed. Um, the idea that that events do act as bat signals. Then, and, and, you know, you see this in the bidding documents of, of all of the um, the events and festivals that we see which is that they say in the bid document that we need this event to advance the economy, but also to solve some social priorities, um, uh, to make the, uh, you know, to solve certain social issues that are occurring at the local level. For example, in London 2012, with a case that I, I did my PhD on, it was mainly about how do you create a post-industrial area in East London um, that had a huge amount of socioeconomic uh, decline that were in the top 5% of the deprived areas in the entire country. How do we create an, an economy and a and community that is inclusive to those interests? And how do we design that in a way that is inclusive? Um, for Japan, it was about shifting the dial on lots of different things. Um, it was a really interesting, fascinating case. One of them was the was kind of in a way post Fukushima, we're trying to think about how um, Japan bounces back in the international community with lower uh, tourist levels um, and how, and it certainly obviously did that very well. And then, but also how do you tackle um, historic issues around um, inclusivity of people with disability? And how do we bring these people into the visitor economy and create more accessible and inclusive um, tourist experiences, for example? And again, this is something that we looked at in a little bit more detail. And it was fascinating to see um, how Japan did that, putting some kind of very structural um, uh, issues in place, redesigning train stations, for example, right through to trying to change the attitudes of the Japanese people towards being a little bit more compassionate towards disabled people. All of these, all of uh, all of these efforts were well noted by the international community. And although Japan is very different to the approach in in in, in the UK, for example, or the US or or Brazil. It was really interesting to see how you were shifting and using the event to shift the dial. And this is what I mean by events and, as bat signals. Events are really this. We need this event to achieve these certain outcomes. But of course, when you shift a light and signal out, the light and signal also sheds a light back into the destination. And, and by doing that, it sheds light on all the challenges that are going on. In the destination, you get a huge amount of media critique. You get a huge amount of commentators looking at Japan. Um, all the eyes are on Japan uh, in, in that sense for a, for a very kind of long period of time. And a lot of people are on YouTube talking about Japanese culture, Japanese society, the good, the bad, the ugly, as they do with all of the major events. And there's something very special about that. Um, that we can use. So my view is that events are powerful because they do act as these bat signals when change is needed. And, and, and the idea is that they lead to these long, long-term outcomes. But then the question is, well, how do we understand these long-term outcomes? What are the theoretical frameworks that we can use in order to understand the longitudinal outcomes? And, um, and this lends ourselves to this idea called field configuring events. And, and anyone interested in the long-term benefits and outcomes of field configuring events will find this hopefully fascinating. And, and, and I've written a couple of things, and, and Meng, you've got my um, web address. 
but it's www.mikedignan.com. On there, I've uh, put all my research open access, so you can uh, definitely um, look at it. But you'll find that I've written a few things on this, some theoretical things, some more practical things uh, in the journals um, uh, that we, uh, some of us might publish them. And, and, and field configuring or events come from two areas, really. Uh, the first one is a, a sociological area of Bourdieu and, and social fields and social theory and, and really why do social fields and so, social life develop in certain ways and how do we how do ideologies change over time? Why do people behave and act and think and do policy uh, in, in, in certain ways and why does that change? So it's from that area, but the, you also got the business school people that saw events as really powerful, and they merged the idea of Bajou, uh, the, the concepts of Bajou and other people, together with this idea of field logic and field configuring change. And they were interested in, well, what are the structures in order to illustrate how events change things? They thought that Bajou stuff was maybe a little bit fuzzy and a little bit not um, specific enough to explain why events are powerful. So they brought together this idea spe specifically in 2008 in a special issue of the Journal of Management Studies, which is a, obviously an amazing ranked journal. So the idea that top, top business school journals that Chicago, MIT, uh, Harvard Business School co scholars write in, it's very interesting to see that journal talk about events in this way. And it's in this 2008 issue that they talk about in a lot more detail, this field configuring events perspective. And you'll be able to find this online, but if you can't, let me know and I can show you in the same direction. But here to explain field configuring events, I've pulled out a quote to try and explain in their words um, what field configuring events are. And they describe that events are crucibles very interesting word, a crucible, where people from diverse organizations and with diverse purposes assemble periodically or on a one-time basis to announce new products, develop industry standards, construct social networks, recognize accomplishments, share and interpret information, and transact business. Field configuring events are arenas in which networks are constructed, business cards are exchanged, reputations are advanced, deals are struck, news is shared, accomplishments are recognized, standards are set, and dominant designs are selected. Field configuring events can enhance, reorient, or even undermine existing technologies, industries, or markets. Or alternately, they can become crucibles from which new technologies, industries, and markets emerge. So this gives a really kind of broad theoretical sense of the kind of things that illustrate where and when change occurs as a result of hosting events. But the idea is that events are crucibles, these platforms um, and arenas where you know networks are constructed, where we talk about our shared interests. That might be at the G8 summit with politicians which are really interesting, or they might be through the international business and in interactions at, at major sports events. doesn't really matter. The main thing is that we explain uh, why events are so powerful. And this occurs, and this power and this change, in, in my view, based on what I've read in the literature, acts over three specific types of fields. Industrial fields, for example, the creative industries, or the tourism industries or retail industry. It occurs geographically, colloquially we refer to that as in the field, which may be where, for example, Meng, your research might be relevant, whereby you're looking at the role of events for regional revitalization, for urban regeneration, for community development, inside a specific geography. And then you have policy, fields and movements. And I was always really interested in terms of why is it that key movements like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Time's Up, um, all women's rights, gay rights, etc. Why do they always coalesce around events? Why do they always coalesce around events 
festivals, large scale events like the Academy Awards or LGBTQ plus um, pride movements or the Olympics. It's really interesting. And there's something interestingly theoretical about events that may make them interesting to look at. And so therefore we have some conceptual understandings. What are the conceptual features of events uh, that are of interest? Well, I'll kind of go through fairly quick because I've got a little bit more to cover, but they're one-off occurrences and they act and they have um, a, a specific presence in a tractable setting. So in a really specific place, in a really specific time. And that occurs over a protracted period of time. You host these things over one, two, three, four, five years. And in that period of time, a huge amount of, 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 of change can happen. Unlike, for example, an event that is planned over two weeks. An event like, for example, Tokyo 2020 is an extreme case, is planned over 10 years. Um, and so that makes it really interesting because you have this idea of symbiotic relations between symbolic systems and relational systems. And there I sound like a you know really fuzzy academic talking about these things, but actually they're very practical. The symbolic relations and systems. Symbolic systems are about the visions, the missions, the, the aim that you have. And the bigger your aim, the more relational and resources that you get. And the bigger resources that you get, that we refer to as relational systems, the bigger that your vision. And the bigger your vision, the bigger the resources, the bigger the resources, the bigger the vision. And it's this escalation of conversation in that period leading up to the event that makes events really special, really, really special. And it seems like a really obvious point for me to say that, but it's true. Um, and it's the reason why it's the theoretical explanation as to why events are really, really special. They exist in this protracted place over um, a tractable space over a protracted period of time. And they exist in wildly contrasting cultural settings. They're very, very, if you look at the Olympics, for example, they're very, very similar every time, but they're also very, very different because they exist in lots of different um, contexts. And they bring stakeholders together. Some of people are united in a shared vision as part of the symbolic system, and other times they're not. So you have these whole range of voluntary and involuntary stakeholders that are part of this. Of course, you mix all of that up with the fact that you have a mediatized gaze, the fact that the entire world is watching. These particular issues play out in a particular time, and these are amazing mechanisms of change. And we've seen this practically play out in lots of different ways. And I've got two examples here. The first one is the fact that we need that longitudinal perspective to understand what London 2012 did for the entire global idea of sustainability. As a result of hosting London 2012, we developed the idea of, and we emerged the idea that became an international standard of ISO, uh, ISO 2012-1, which was the International Sustainable Events um, Protocol. What does that mean? That means that a lot of events and festivals are now using that protocol in order to understand um, how to be more sustainable internationally. Well, going back to my point before in terms of major events as a Northern Star, that becomes quite obvious here because the event was a Northern Star on sustainability. And then out of that became an, an, a, a non-sporting event, international movement that pushed together and pushed forward towards sustainability and the UN SDGs. It's because of the event that helped push that forward. But if you're an event organizer or owner, <clears throat> how do you explain that it was the event that helped that? It's really difficult. So that's a really, really important one. But then also you've got negative effect that come from it. So for example, London 2012, we wrote a piece that suggested that in the period um, after the event, actually because of a whole range of different economic austerity related issues and economic, you know, defunding of certain sports for disabled people with disabilities, we saw that 
or we argued that in some sense, disabled people's lives have worsened. So we also need to be very careful to understand both the positive and the negative and have a very open and honest uh, debate here. Um, this is the theoretical model that I wrote in one of my papers to explain um, why events are powerful over a period of time. I'm not going to go into detail, but again, you'll find that in the research uh, paper that I mentioned. I will finish probably in about, you know, five minutes, I promise. And I'll just, because I just really want to give a, a critical view, and I started with it there, which is the idea that I've been really, really positive uh, about events and the power of events, but Events have been always these great platforms for unmasking problems, for protesting against problems. We saw that in every single major event. They can be ways to help communities in lots of different ways and emancipate people and emancipate problems. But they can obviously also be these carnival masks. This smoke and mirror idea that we see in the critical literature that act as a way to mask problems and mask issues. And Slavov Zizek, the sociologist, refers to this as events acting as ideological fetishes. They are so shiny and interesting that they divert our entire attention away from fundamental problems that matter. Um, and we need to be very, very careful um, that we're not uh, diverted or distracted away from these things. Um, and, and these things are really real. <clears throat> And you have what we refer to um, as the unlistened to story. There are many, many people's um, experiences and understandings and, ex uh, and, and, and lives that are affected by large scale events um, from discrimination to um, the displacement of marginal groups and vulnerable groups to gentrification of pricing out communities of getting rid of homeless people um, in some sense, police brutality, um, just general uneven economic development, the disruption of life. That means for a lot of people, their views don't matter. A lot of these narratives never make the surface. And I think a lot of us as academics have focused on these narratives because there's been so many challenges. And we've almost said we're going to leave the positive narratives to the people that are running these events to, to argue why uh, these events are good for society. We need to continue the critique always, um, particularly with Qatar that's happened, some of the human rights violations that we see on the ground empirically that we can't ignore. But we also obviously need to make sure that we be balanced in our analysis. And in, in my view, we don't want to get sucked in to a biased analysis. We need to also think about how these events can be better and provide recommendations. Otherwise, they'll never be better. And it's important to conceptualize the idea of events as these that destroyers and creators of worlds like Shiva. Um, they are modes of creative destruction. They are uh, they break down old things and develop new things. Um, they are modes of creative destructions. They are um, they are what Schumpeter would argue, Schumpeter's gale, these gale force winds that change things. Sometimes they are happy to accept the negative social costs um, when it seems as though the economic benefits are very, very bountiful. OK, depending on one's perspective or perspective on moral philosophy will determine whether or not that's a good thing or not. I'm going to not provide my perspective on that. Personally, I think that that is a um, uh, that is up to the individual, the society, the context in order to understand whether this perspective is a good one. It will really come down to three areas, obviously, of moral philosophy. The first one being uh, deontology. Deontology is 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 in rule based systems uh, whereby there are principles and norms and standards and rules to honor. Um, for example, this is very much um, uh, in the uh, Japanese psyche that there are certain lines in the sand that you do not cross, uh, that there are rules and procedures and protocols that we do not cross um, in societies that might uh, who, that are thinking on those lines. They might believe that the negative social costs and the challenges associated are not worth the outcome. 
that they are that they contrast against our values, our honors uh, too much. Uh, so if one takes a deontological perspective, then an Kantian ethical perspective, they might see events as not good enough for us and not providing a net social outcome. The second one, um, in a more kind of American philosophy, Western philosophy, whereby actually we're happy to often accept, whether we like it or not, society and empirical evidence on the ground illustrates very clearly that we're happy to accept um, some of the negative consequences of hosting these things because we think that the overall net value of hosting is good enough that we think that the overall um, quantity of happiness is higher. Uh, maybe that is a guiding philosophy for whether we think these things are good or not. And then we have more virtue ethics, whether these events um, have the characteristics and the traits and the virtuous traits that we believe align well enough to our um, developmental priorities at a local level, at a country level, at a contextual and cultural level, um, whether they we believe that they have virtues in lots of different ways. And anyone interested in that might wish to go back to the original source of Aristotle's virtues and the golden mean in order to understand uh, whether on that line they can be argued. My view, I didn't say I was going to give it. My, uh, my view is that we need a mixture between ontological and consequentialist views, whereby uh, there is often going to be some people that are going to be less positively affected by these things, but there should be fundamental lies in the sand. For example, human rights violations, um, uh, deaths as a result, uh, people's livelihoods being completely damaged by these things. For me, that is something we need to be very, very careful of and have a very strong leadership and position on. I'm happy to say that uh, as part of talks, as part of uh, uh, the public ether this is going to go on youtube it's really important uh, that we 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 lead and we 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 hold events to account i think they need to be tweaked but i don't think that we should get rid of them completely and so therefore the question becomes that the irony is not really lost when the idea of olympism and if you look into the terms of the bid documents of these things they often say that they're much they're amazing they they have fundamental ethical principles that guide inclusivity around human dignity when actually in real terms these events have really not provided much dignity for some stakeholder groups and and therefore there is an irony at the center of these things. And I think that this is the thing that people are concerned about, um, that they pretend to be one thing and not the other. The issue is, is that, as I mentioned before, large scale events, um, big events often uh, divert our attention, just as war diverts our attention away from things. War can divert our attention away from micro level things that are occurring on the ground. And it's only after the fog of war that we realize that there's been injustices as well as the war itself. And mega events are a little bit like this as well. There's a lot of people that have hindsight bias that look back and go, oh, if only we'd have known that that was gonna happen or these things would happen. Instead, my view is that we need to start looking at what I would refer to as actually existing rights abuses. People's rights that are being abused or people not getting, not being included enough um, and drawing a line and trying to look out for these things while the event's going on and before. Keeping your eyes on the little things and, and, and the academics, we can do this and bring together these issues. Keeping your eyes on the little things so we tackle them and create an inclusive and just society now, not always reflecting back on what we should have done. That's really important that we shift our attention away from what's happening now to expose and challenge. And, it, you know, in the journal that, 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 that I run, that Meng's part of and many people all around the world are a part of, having brave, bold, honest conversations, talking about these things, if you want to be critical, we're really, really open uh, to really. L uh, one of the last slides, I promise. So... If you ask anyone who is at the center of major events, um, what is the problem here? They all know the problem. 
They really all know the problem. They know the challenges in terms of major events. They know that they shouldn't do certain things like disrupt or displace particular people's interests. They need to be more inclusive. That's the reason why the Olympic bidding process, for example, has now brought in more rights, social responsibilities, uh, the UNS, uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals as a core fundamental reason for evaluating bids. That is their honest hands up. These things need to be better. So we can see they're doing that. They're, they're thinking on those lines. And if you have conversations with these people, you will find that they re there are a lot of people that are really positive and trying to make a change. The problem is it's the way in which the governance of mega events are run. It's the fact that there's so many organizations at the individual governmental, institutional event level, that it really is just a bewildering network of individual stakeholders. None of them really knows what the left and right hand are doing um, often. They do, but they also don't. So what you get is this idea, and this was from a House of Lords report after London 2012, you get a cacophony of well-meaning, but very disorganized actors. And we sometimes refer to this as the problem of many hands. Too many hands are involved. So it's really difficult to understand who exactly has primary responsibility. Primary responsibility for things, protecting people, um, who owns what, who owns what problem. And the governance, a critical scholar might say that it's designed in this way, that it's designed to allow this occurrence because we live in a neoliberal paradigm? I don't think so. I don't take that negative um, uh, perspective on it. Um, I personally think that this occurs in all large-scale networks. This isn't just events. This is a neoliberal events thing. This is events are just designed in that way. Um, and, 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 and there's just a huge amount of people that gets the job done. Um, I don't think it's intended. I don't think that there's a ne neoliberal puppet master. But I do think that there is a neoliberal problem at the center of it that needs to be tackled. And we need to rethink and redesign and add uh, uh, responsibility at the sign. Sometimes, obviously, there's many people on the ground that do know things are going on and have the power to act, but they don't act. And they shrink from acting because maybe they don't have the um, uh, the courage to act on the ground when they see things occurring in lots of different ways. And when people try to protest about these things, and people have written about this a lot, it people within uh, who believe that there's an injustice, like we see on the streets of major events, people protesting about these things, they buzz angrily in the ears of people organizing these things in in the ears of their governments. And, and But they never really have their, their voices heard that much. This is the difference between permission and right. People have the permission to talk. You can say whatever you want, argue whatever you want, but you don't have the right to do anything about it. And this is the reason why protesters are very angry. They possess, in their view, they possess a, possess a truth, but not enough people are listening, or not maybe not the right ones are listening and 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 so therefore the rights to talk and have your voice heard are still in the pe people of those with power and that power needs to be devolved more democratically um into communities that's my perspective on it that seems to be the trend that we're going into um as academics i guess it's our case to think about how we might do that and it is a real paradox of our time uh that essentially tiktokers people on twitter LinkedIn, whoever, they can build armies of followers of millions and millions and millions of followers, tens of millions in some sense. They might promulgate uh, not very interesting things, or they might promulgate a whole range of things uh, that are uh, interesting for social media, but they don't tell us anything about society. And people are listening in millions, but yet these abuses and, and some of the real challenges on the ground in society completely ignored. And I personally, there's a very interesting paradox going on that we're entirely distracted away from issues that are going on. Um, and, and, you know, I sit um, uh, on the evening with my wife and watch Netflix and all these sort of so, sorts of entertainment challenges. 
I'm completely distracted in lots of different ways when actually I could be a more productive citizen. And, you know, some some people might say that society is designed in that way, um, but we need to be a little bit more uh, focused about around the problem, really. Um, so that's 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 kind of my my view um, that we need to be a bit more conscious and a little bit more um, uh, aware of some of these some of these things, because we, we if we want events to be better, we have to kind of maintain the critique on them. So to kind of come uh, uh, to conclude, uh, we have this superpower of convergence, work with stakeholders, work with industry when they will listen. If they don't listen, consider how you make them listen and how you get around the table. You all have something really, really powerful to say to these stakeholders and work together toward a problem and not defending a discipline. Don't defend a discipline. Uh, for example, for event management journal, I'm not interested in you defending a discipline. If you're interested in submitting to the journal, I'm not interested in submitting to the discipline. We've got a special issue at the moment in tourism management with Stephen Page, and, and it's on mega events and tourism development, so kind of perfect um, for, 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 for people who are interested in, in this area. Um, we're really keen to focus, even in tourism management, for this on problems and how we can use a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary and convergent lens. We need a deeper analysis in terms of how we understand impact. So hopefully the capital development framework that I showed earlier will give you a sense of all the different holistic areas. We do have this existential problem. We don't want to look at impacts right now only. We want to look at their real reconfiguring and longitudinal power um, over time, thinking, and, and that's a huge space in the literature for looking at that. We need to focus on um, framing some of these inclusivity and sustainability issues as a rights issue. Is it a human or community right that they should benefit or not? That's that's interesting. And that really up to, is up to cultural context to decide that because legitimacy is purely defined by the social context in which you're looking. Um, so that's that's a, an interesting question to have at a local level. We need to keep our eyes on the prize in terms of making making sure that we're examining actually existing rights or responsibility issues at the local level and trying to intervene earlier. That would be a, a key area, a huge gap in the literature. Um, and we want to do all this because we want to create research that goes into our students' education, goes into the education of our leaders and government actors that might read it, mm -hmm. needs to be accessible and interesting and relevant. And we want to create these socially conscious leaders um, all around the world. And we start with the students in our, in our room um, and, you know, and then we work towards trying to influence government. Um, we have a project at the moment called Event Rights. Uh, it's the largest European Union funded project looking at um, uh, rights based issues in events. If anyone's interested, drop me a line. There's also a web link there. Um, thank you so much uh, for listening. Uh, you can more than welcome to drop me a line on LinkedIn, send me an email. Um, or have a look at my website. I, I put everything up there that I've ever done that you can listen to. And I'll put this talk up there uh, as well from, from the YouTube as well as Meng's YouTube channel. Uh, but yeah, if you ever want to talk about what this means for you, your research, um, and what it might mean for uh, getting your work in in um, event management journal, Meng is our um, uh, regional editor for Japan. Uh, because we really want to try and bring together more regional research to try and honor um, what's going on in each region. So please do reach out to Meng um, if you want to learn a little bit more in terms of how you can be part of the journal on the board, but also part of the intellectual movement. So I'll stop um, there. But thank you so much for for having me. Um, and maybe I can leave it over to Meng now to open yeah. the floor and answer any questions. Okay, much appreciated, Mike. And also, thanks a lot, our audience. Uh, I see people still here. It's almost like 11.15. Uh, Mike, could you just spend two or three minutes to introduce the, the Journal of Event Management? Maybe some student has interest with that. Sure. If, if, if you've never heard of it, it's Event Management was founded in 1993. It's a 30-year-old journal. It has a long history founded by Professor Don Getz and Professor Bruce Wicks. Um, it was meant to be our kind of leading 
event and festival journal. And over the, the last years, it's become our leading events and festival journal based in New York. Um, but it's really, really international. Um, we honor um, all kind of perspectives, disciplinary perspectives, management perspectives, sociology, anthropology, geography, urban development, regional studies, any perspective that helps shed light on um, events, their role, their power potential for people, places, communities, citizens, governments, policy. Um, we're really, really interested in anything that's related to events and festivals um, from any perspective, really, um, particularly from your region, um, really thinking about what um, we can learn from regional perspectives. A huge amount of the work in event studies has been primarily focused on global north and Western perspectives, a lot of the models that we use primarily uh, in a lot of places are designed from those perspectives. This is a huge problem because mm -hmm. although they might be useful in some sense, they might really not apply very well um, in others. You might find that they don't apply or transcend or connect to a, um, a, a Japanese context, for example. The idea is to have just much more dialogue between uh, this international journal and, and in this sense, Japanese perspectives to bring them in. Um, so we have a whole range of different ways you can submit to the journal. So that might be through a traditional research article whereby you're trying to um, advance theory and scholarship and advance ideas. So it might be a more theoretical contribution or it might be an event case study whereby you take existing theory and then try and apply it um, to a case study to give us a more rich empirical context, maybe a Japanese context, to then shed light on the theory, but maybe not advance the theory. So we have that. That's called an event case study. Then we have critical commentaries and research notes, whereby they're very short. But if there's an idea or, or an inspiration that you've had, maybe from your context or maybe theoretically that you want to just get out there, but you don't want to write a really, really long research paper, you can send it to us. Obviously, it has to be well-referenced and it has to be rigorous and it has to be interesting and relevant. Um, but if you've got a burning idea that you want to write and publish on, then we're really open to that as well. And then we have an events education route. So this is really important. There's many, many great academics that are also great educators and doing great things in learning and teaching. A lot of my colleagues weren't necessarily doing research, but they were doing really innovative and cutting edge teaching. So if you fall into that category, you can also submit um, uh, to the journal. Um, so you can uh, you can submit to the journal under the events education route. But yeah, any perspective, any field, you can be events in hospitality, events tourism, uh, you can be a historian in events. You can be an anthropologist of events. It might just be that events is the context whereby you're looking at. So you might not think of yourself as an event scholar, but we would see you as part of our community. Um, and that makes it, it, it open for you to be able to um, uh, submit to the journal. So hopefully that gives a bit of a, a bit of an overview. But Meng, maybe you might want to say something quickly right. about your role as a regional editor. Oh yeah, uh, so we just launched, uh, we will launch the regional editor initiative. I think there are, there are 20 regional editors now around the globe. I think this is also a good initiative to rethinking event very differently. Like Mike mentioned the Western thinking from the beginning of your lecture. That's also connect to one of my questions. I would like to you to explain more uh, what, what are the consequences uh, if we're only using the theoretical framework from the Western thinking, from both industry and in institutional understanding yeah. of this? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. What are the actual implications for everyone? Well, I, the best I, I could give you quite a few, but the best example is the critique that is bestowed by academics, um, policymakers, practitioners, but also the media for contexts that they don't really fully understand. Um, so for example, um, Qatar, for all the challenges that it had, um, had a huge amount of critique on it um, for in, in lots of different, you know, justifiable ways, but unjustifiable ways. It's because we were really looking at it through our Western lens. We weren't really trying to understand 
the cultural and contextual nuances of what's going on in Qatar. We weren't trying to understand the contextual and cultural nuances of Qatar's history and where it's coming from and where it's going to go. And so what you end up doing is, is if essentially all the theoretical frameworks have been developed out of primarily Western empirical context, then you're always going to design it in a way that, that is going to be Western viewed. And so scholars and students all over the world will take these ideas as truth. They'll take these ideas, but they're not true. They're really contextually rooted in a culture that they've been written in. And, and the issue is, is that therefore there might be too much critique that's been disposed on areas, on context that they just don't necessarily are aware of, um, either through case studies, either through the theoretical frameworks. So, for example, Rio, I have to say, Rio... Um, got way too much uh, critique from 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 media outlets for example um tokyo uh, were was critiqued as well qatar beijing all of these contexts that aren't london aren't paris um and nor are no nor would they be um they have their own history their own culture their own journey that they're going on and and i don't think it's very fair that we uh, Whilst we want everyone to grow and, 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 and apply positive um, outcomes to hosting these events, and we want us all to kind of grow together to have the most just, inclusive, accessible society, we can't apply a London model for Tokyo. And we can't apply a Tokyo model for London. We can't apply a, a London model on Qatar. We can't apply a Western thinking on Middle Eastern sports events. They can learn a lot from each other, but we just need to bring in some of those and honor some of those regional insights to think, actually, hang on, there is a way in which we could all learn from each other. A really good example is one of my colleagues, Coyote, who is our um, regional editor for the um, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, 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 Middle East, and uh, uh, not actually, no, no, South Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, various other countries, including Nigeria, Ghana. And we were talking about how they plan events. And he was saying that in some cultures, the shaman rolls the dice, throws the dice on the floor. Mm -hmm. and, and essentially that will determine when you host an event. And for Ghana or Nigeria or whichever cultures um, uh, use this method, that's not very clever if you're trying to try and attract international tourists because international tourists need a lot longer mm. uh, to plan their, their journeys, to plan for children, to plan for you know care and all that sort of thing. But for example, they could throw the dice maybe one year before or they could throw the dice. And, and one might say that's quite a good example of really sensible mm. Western planning uh, or, or planning more generally. Um, but then, for example, in Rio, one of the beautiful things that we found when we were on the ground doing research during the live staging was unlike London that came before it for the 2012 Olympics, what you had was in London, you had very, very well organized event areas. So you would arrive at a train station, you would get to the venue and you would be forced through in, in, in the tracks right? You'd be forced through to get to the venue as quickly as possible. So you could spend your money in the corporate sponsors and the commercial entities. In Rio, they had a much more informal approach. They made the area way more carnival, way more party. They had local people selling local food, local cultural production. It was a way in which you could honor both the global event, but also the local event. And it goes back to my contact idea around paradox, organizational paradox. In the West, we always resolve paradox, which is stupid. We need to honor paradox. It's like the yin and yang symbol. Everything needs to have a little bit of each other, even though the white is contradiction to the black because they're completely the opposite, but they still exist at the same time because we honor these mutually exclusive areas. And this can be illustrated very practically in Rio, whereby you had a highly organized global event 
but you also allowed local people and informality to create events. Okay, why is that interesting for my students? I'm now in Florida talking uh, uh, to Saudi Arabian students and students all, the, all around the world and saying the Saudi Arabian method for creating these more informal environments is something that we need to learn in Western context. Mm. And, 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 but you also have to think about security and safety concerns and, and organize your event in a highly planned way as well. Mm. You can have both things, but you just have to work out how to honor the two cultures together. And I'm sure that there's so many examples in yeah. Japan um, yeah. that you could probably give. Yeah, fascinating. So is there any question from uh, our audience, uh, students and faculty members? I'm sorry, it's really late to ask people to prepare questions, but if there is any. You could always not, give me a line later. Uh, yes. And also, uh, like I, I really appreciate that you mentioned about the geographical factor as well as a policy. I think I'm very uh week on focus on policy but i recently i realized it's one of the very important factor to impact festivals uh and uh also back to your research theoretical framework it's really fascinating it only showed three seconds but i noticed there is a two factor between the symbolic systems and relational systems. Could you explain a little bit more about this part? I'm really interested uh, with everything re relational. <laughs> which 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 part in particular, Meng? Uh, your theoretical framework, you mentioned uh, 5A, symbolic systems, and 5B, relational systems. The, uh, yeah. The very I, complicated I, I, part, yeah. You want me to explain them a little bit, yeah? Yeah, what do you think, uh, how do you define relational from your research? Yeah, no, it's, it's and it's and it's obviously one of those concepts that, that mm. means a lot to different people, depending on how the disciplines used it over time. But for, in this very specific context of field configuring events, mm. um, symbolic systems are just anything that has any sort of symbolic value. So anything that provides any sort of symbolism and, 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 and the way that they apply this in events context are the sorts of uh, visions, missions, aims, um, objectives that are put in place by, for example, politicians, governments, even academics. Everyone's involved in creating visions of what mm -hmm. this event is. That's the beauty with, with events. They include so many different stakeholder perspectives um, and I, I it, they and they need to be super democratic because they need to serve so many people. So therefore, so many people's aims and objectives need to be at the center of it, mm. not just an autocratic top down approach. So you have this entire coming together of everyone to discuss what they think the event should do visions for the future. And the more intense that is with people with visions, you the more you can essentially convince governments regions, universities, departments, mm. in order to give academics, policymakers, students money in order to address those mm. um, uh, symbolic systems. And, and that's what we mean by the relational systems. It's the coming together of all the different relations and relationships um, in together in like a re resourcing arrangement that then fuels, I would say that it fuels the the symbolic systems it gives it strength it gives it power um and the more visionary you are mm. um the more resources you get and the more people you bring along the ride for the journey as well so I, that's fascinating in lots of different ways and for mm. me that is the one thing that makes events of all shapes and sizes it could be a small local community festival that's mm -hmm. planned for three months or it might be the biggest extreme case of the Olympics, it doesn't mm. really matter. This is a theoretical idea, and and this shows that events have the power and potential for social and economic good in so many ways, depending on where you go. This is why it's so applicable to everyone, hopefully, that's in the room interested in events and festivals. Uh, okay, we have one question from uh, our audience. Uh, Zhao asked, if major events are holding in small cities or rural areas, 
how could we balance the economic development and culture in uh invasion in a way or investment what do you mean that major event bring to those places except that the local community hold their own so do you want to give some comment on this that's a really great point it's the it's it's that's an increasing shift if you look in the literature the mobilization of satellite cities to host mm-hmm. these things is really interesting. And, and you've got it kind of, it's best to think about it in three ways. One, you have the host city, the intense host city, for example, Tokyo. Um, and then you have the official sites, uh, like where Japan had the um, the surfing um, uh, on the beach side, just, just down the coast. Um, so you've then got official peripheral sites, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that are not in Tokyo, but are still officially part of the programming. Then what you have, and you see this with FIFA, you have official non-hosting sites, mm-hmm. right? Uh, whereby they, they, they it will be state-sponsored or it will be event-sponsored spo- um, uh, areas whereby they will have live screens where the community can come together to watch. The mm-hmm. event go in and there might be some of the sponsors. So this will be typically a way to bring everyone together for the event who can't get a ticket and and they will spend money in the corporate sponsors. So it's a way of in an urban studies language. It's extra territoriality. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's an extra spatial ancillary spaces in order to extend the commercial value, mm-hmm. I guess, of the event in lots of spaces. But then you have a fourth one that I've only just kind of conceptualized in my head as part of formulating this response, which is you have then increasingly community organized Mm -hmm. events going on. And and they will say, well, we're going to use the magic dust of the games, the mediatized spectacle, and we're going to even ask our local journalists, we're even going to ask our local politicians to come, even though they might not be official, part of Tokyo 2020, for example, but we're still going to make use of it. And what you find in the literature is that anything that is grassroots, that is designed by and for the people, will always have um, a a stronger uh, socioeconomic benefit um, for lots of different reasons that I can't go into detail. Um, and, And I will never forget one community saying to me during my PhD when I was looking at London 2012, Mm -hmm. there is a small calf show in London that we think has delivered better benefits. And it's only for four hours. There is a car show that we've Mm -hmm. had in our community um, that's delivered better benefits than 10 years of preparing and then having the Olympics. And, and, And that for me showed what the Olympics really means to a lot of local people um, Mm. that it's not really for them. And it really goes back to my idea that events exist as cities within cities. They border themselves. They don't want to engage because in order to engage, they have to distribute the benefits in lots of different ways. They have to, um, they have to dilute the commercial benefits for the sponsors. If they get people to move into the destination and to spend their money in the local communities. So therefore, the question for me is what is the role that meso level actors play, for example, local, regional, municipality and government actors? Mm. What is the role that they play to stitch together the interests of the event, but also the community? And what is the role that community people can play to be entrepreneurial, to think of this as an opportunity and to try and muscle in Mm -hmm. to the spaces? that the event has. I think it's also incumbent upon local people and entrepreneurial people to lever the benefits, as well as always asking the government and policymakers to always deliver the benefits on a platter. And I think that it requires both to come together. So I think that that is a great pragmatic suggestion that that you just said, I think it was Zhao. Um, And we need to see more of that local community organizing Um, that is delivered by them for them and we've seen this in some several local contexts including the commonwealth games in 2022 in Birmingham. 
So uh, we are almost time, but I still have one last question. Is since you mentioned about the creative destruction, recently I've been working on a few papers about creative uh, destruction and enhancement with events. So I'm thinking uh, events can also be enhancement, not only destruction. So I would like to know your experience about that. Uh, yeah, not it's not only yeah, mm. it, it's enhancement as well as dis, uh, destruction. Is that what you said, mm -hmm. Meng? Yeah, uh, right. yeah. Well, I guess I guess for the all the the reasons that I mentioned, um, they for me this is a a complete data problem. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether it's because in my mind, even though I'm a qualitative researcher. I tend to think in lots of ones and zeros as well, um, which is that if you look at essentially most of what we know about events mm -hmm. um, and, and their value and their enhancing effect, most of the research is qualitative or yeah. not very good quantitative. <laughs> and, 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 and I would argue that at the very, very top of everything that we're talking about now, we need an epistemological shift fundamentally mm. in this big data chat GPT AI revolution. We need um, bigger data sets to illustrate change occurring. And, mm. and so we have lots of examples, small scale sample examples of where events are really revitalizing communities mm. uh, and, and, and really enhancing people, mm. enhancing people's, motivation to go to work to be a better person in their homes and in mm. their families to be a productive citizen to be um more volunteering in the right. community mm. we know we know all of this and we have placed faith in events mm. to do that and we we get we know it the mm. issue is now is that without data and without mm. more evidence and without bigger data sets and more robust data sets we're never going to be able to fully argue the enhancing effect. Um, and, and, and this is kind of problematic. And I, I think that academics have, they have a default skeptical, more critical view because we always frame most of our work around problems or challenges. And we always push people to be better and organizations and events to be better. This is amazing. This is what I do as well. Like, you know, and many of the people, hopefully in the room, you're mm. always posing a challenge. We need to be better, 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 better. We also need to just step back a second and go, okay, we can be better there, but mm. we should also think about the net benefit as well. We need to spend a little bit more time suggesting why events are also really awesome and, and, and really great for people. But at the moment, the the, the 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 you know there's a huge narrative that's really anti big events and 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 for me big events need to be better in order to uh, collect more data to evidence why they exist and to prove to the community and the population that they should exist um and and to illustrate to your point uh, the enhancing effect right. that they have yeah maybe maybe the way we define events is always about uh, how many people participate or how many days maybe we should change another way to think about how many community stakeholders are, are beneficials i think that's it that's mm. it and try and in some sense and i know you know we're, we're both qualitative researchers and many of us are in this field and mm. and there is something that we feel kind of tense up in us when we think about putting a number on things um but really in order to explain it's very it's very interesting uh, uh qualitative researchers primarily take a subjective lens on mm -hmm. on things and and uh, but but they will always use language that is very very often use language that is very quantitative so they'll say well mm -hmm. it doesn't deliver on the net positive outcome for mm -hmm. us Right. But hang on. By using the word net means that you have to have some sort of quantitative indicator. Right. right. In order, like you said, Meng, in order to explain the more stable and objective benefits like participation, like mm -hmm. um, economic deprivation going down, participation, 
the participation of very specific groups, for example, people with disabilities in the visitor economy? Are there more people now with disabilities going to festivals or going to um, temples or wherever in around? Are, are they increasingly more mobilized? Can you draw a map of, mm -hmm. of increasing mobility of disabled people with disabilities around the country? Um, to do that, you need data, you need quantitative analyses. Um, so therefore, we do need to, you know, suck it up a little bit and, and be more quantitative in our mindset. And that, for me, is where I'm moving to. And I would suggest that people, um, if they're really, really wanting to champion, but also critique, but champion the effect of events, um, we need to move. We need to move there. Um, otherwise, our small scale sample is not really fully addressing right. the power of them. Okay, sorry, we are uh, just right on time, but I really want to hear more because every slides from you seems like a full paper. But uh, but I have to stop. Uh, I, I think festival events are really one of the most complicated social uh, interaction product made by the mankind. Um, uh, and we are very glad to invite you to talk about your recent thought on um, a mega event and Olympic and a very fascinating. I really wish I uh, can hear more from you. And maybe our, I already shared all the websites, uh, your website, your publication, as well as the journal website. So if any, any uh, students want to challenge the Journal of Event Management, we really encourage you to do that. We also have more initiative will be launched, sorry. Uh, at the beginning of 2024, right? Next year, we will have more initiative, including the writing retreat, also international conference. Uh, yeah, let's do that. That's great. Thank you, Meng. And thank you all for staying up for so long. If you have any questions at all, uh, yes. feel free to have a chat with Meng or, or, or drop me a line. Uh, yeah. But yeah, huge, uh, huge pleasure and honor yeah. to, uh, to talk with you all. Right. I will upload this uh, this recording maybe this week so everybody can rewatch it as much as you want. OK, thank you very much and uh, have a great day and have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone. Sleep well. See you. See you.